Preface, Chapter 1 and 2 of Life and Adventures of Jack Engel, an Autobiography. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Margaret Espayat. Life and Adventures of Jack Engel, an Autobiography by Walt Whitman. Prefatory. Candidly, reader, we are going to tell you a true story. The narrative is written in the first person because it was originally jotted down by the principal actor in it for the entertainment of a valued friend. From that narrative, although the present is somewhat elaborated, with an unimportant leaving out here and putting in there, there has been no departure in substance. The main incidents were of actual occurrence in this good city of New York, and there will be a sprinkling of our readers by no means small who will wonder how the deuce such facts, as they happen to know them, ever got into print. We shall, in the narrative, give the performers in this real drama unreal names, and, for good reasons, throw just enough of our own toggery about them to prevent their being identified by strangers. Some of the faces embodied in the story have come to our knowledge from sources other than that above mentioned, these we shall add, or withhold, as the interest of the detail may demand. Chapter 1. An approved specimen of young America, the lawyer in his office, old age down at the heel, entrance of Telemachus and Ulysses, a bargain closed. Punctually at half-past twelve, the noonday sun shining flat on the pavement of Wall Street, a youth with the pious name of Nathaniel, clapped upon his closely cropped head a straw hat, for which he had that very morning given the sum of twenty-five cents and announced his intention of going to his dinner. Covert, attorney at law, stared into the room, it was a downtown law office, from the door which was opened wide and fastened back for coolness, and the real covert at that moment looked up from his cloth-covered table in an inner apartment whose carpet bookcases, musty smell, big chair with leather cushions, and the panels of only one window out of three being opened, and they but partially so, announced it as the sanctum of the sovereign master there. That gentleman's garb marked him as one of the sect of friends or Quakers. He was a tallish man, considerably round-shouldered, with a pale, square, closely shaven face, and one who possessed any expert as a physiognomist could not mistake a certain sanctimonious satanic look out of the eyes. From some suspicion that he didn't appear well in that part of his countenance, Mr. Covert had a practice of casting down his visual organs. On this occasion, however, they lighted on his errand boy. "'Yes, go to thy dinner. Both can go,' said he, "'for I want to be alone.' and Wigglesworth, the clerk, a tobacco-scented old man, he smoked and chewed incessantly, left his high stool in the corner where he had been slowly copying some document. Old Wigglesworth, I must drop a word of praise and regret upon you here, for the Lord gave you a good soul, ridiculous old codger that you were. I know few more melancholy sights than these old men present, whom you see here and there about New York, apparently without chick or child, very poor, their lips caved in upon toothless gums, dressed in seedy and greasy clothes, and ending their lives on that just debatable ground between honorable starvation and the poorhouse. Old Wigglesworth had been well off once. The key to his losses and his old age of penury was nothing more nor less than intemperance. He did not get drunk out and out, but he was never perfectly sober. Covert now employed him at a salary of four dollars a week. Nathaniel, before mentioned, was a small boy with a boundless ambition, the uttermost end and aim of which was that he might one day drive a fast horse of his own on Third Avenue. In the meantime, he smoked cheap cigars, cultivated with tenderness upon his temples his bright brown hair, in that form denominated soap-lock, 
and swept out the office and ran the errands, occasionally stopping to settle a dispute by tongue or fist. For Nathaniel was brave and had a constitutional tendency to thrust his own opinions upon other people by force if necessary. Freed from the presence of the two, Mr. Covert sat meditating and writing alternately until he had finished a letter on which he evidently bestowed considerable pains. He then folded, enveloped, sealed it, and locked it in his desk. A tap at the door. Come in. Two persons enter. One is a hardy, middle-aged man of what is called the working classes. The other is your humble servant, who takes all these pains in narrating his adventures for your entertainment. His name is Jack Engel, and at the time of this introduction he is of the roistering age of twenty, stands about five feet ten in his stocking feet, carries a pair of brown eyes and red cheeks to match, and looks mighty sharp at the girls as they go home through Nassau Street from their work downtown. "'Mr. Covert, I suppose,' said my companion. "'That is my name, sir. Will thee be seated?' "'My name's Foster,' settling himself in a chair and putting his hat on the table. "'You got a line from me the other day, I suppose?' "'Ah, yes, yes,' slowly answers the lawyer. Then looking at me, "'Is this the young man, then?' "'This is the young man, sir, and we've come to see whether we can settle the thing. You see, I want him to be a lawyer, which is a trade he does not much like and would not himself have chosen. But I rather set my heart upon it, and he is a boy that gives in to me and has agreed to study at the business for one year faithfully. And then I have agreed to let him have his own way. He is not thy son, I think I understood, said Covert. Not exactly, answered the other, and yet so near the same to make us no difference. Now you know my mind, and as I am a man of few words, I should like to know yours. Well, we will try him, Mr. Foster, at any rate. Then turning to me, if thee will come in here to-morrow forenoon, young man, between nine and ten, I shall have more leisure for a talk, and we will then make a beginning. Although I warn thee in advance that it will depend entirely upon thyself how thee gets along, my own part will be nothing more than to point out the best road. Which endeth the first chapter. Chapter 2 The Worthy Milkman and How He Trusted People and the Wonderful Luck He Had One Morning in Finding a Precious Treasure This chapter is necessarily retrospective of the preceding one. Among the earliest customers of Ephraim Foster there came one morning a little white-headed boy, neither handsome nor ugly. Ephraim kept a shop in one of the thoroughfares that cross Grand Street, east of the Bowery. He sold milk, eggs, and sundry etc., in winter adding to his vocations those of a purveyor of pork and sausage meat, which is a driving and thriving trade hereabout in cold weather. Fair America rivals ancient Greece in its love of pork. At the proper season you may see, thickly set through the streets, the places for furnishing this favorite winter eating, beautiful red and white slices, mighty hams, either fresh or smoked, sides and forequarters, and at intervals a grinning head with fat cheeks and ears erect. Still more preferable to some, it is the powerfully spiced sausage meat or the jelly-like head cheese. In the preparation of the latter articles, the worthy Ephraim always did wonders, for folks had confidence in him, which is a great deal to bestow on a sausage vendor. However, he deserved it all. He deserved more. He was one of the best fellows that ever lived. People said now and then that he would never set the North River afire, and yet Foster jogged along, even in his pecuniary affairs, faster and steadier than some who had the reputation of much superior cunning. He was, without thinking of it at all, constitutionally kind, liberal, and unselfish. It was in a humble way, to be sure, but none the less credit for that. He had a knack of making mistakes against his own interest, 
giving the customer the odd pennies and never gouging in weight or measure. Then, although the usual sign of no trust hung up over the counter, Ephraim did trust very much, particularly if the family asking indulgence were poor or the father or mother was sick. Although this resulted several times in bad debts that were no trifle to a man in his sort of business, it was marvelous how in the long run he didn't really lose. One time, a year after a certain thumping bill had been utterly despaired of, and the poor journeyman cabinet-maker owing it had moved to another part of the city, things grew brighter with him, and he came round one cool evening to pay up like a man and make Ephraim's wife a pretty present of a work-box. Another time, when the long, long score of a poor woman with little children had been allowed to accumulate nearly all winter, for otherwise they would have starved, the husband, an intemperate, shiftless character, died, and the woman was taken away by her friends. But, strange to tell, who should be engaged by and by as cook in the house of a wealthy family three blocks off, but this very same woman, who grew fat and rosy in a good place, and not only paid the old score, long as it was, although Ephraim himself told her it was no matter, and might as well go now, but the worthy cook began to grow angry then. Not only did she settle the bill, but sent her old friend a great deal of profitable custom. The story of his good deeds went to the ears of the mistress, and thence into other people's, and you may depend Ephraim didn't lose anything by that. So, with all his soft-heartedness, the man might be said to gain nearly enough to balance the really bad accounts, for they were not always coming back, after he gave them up, those unfortunate bills. This was the sort of personage that the little flax-headed boy was lucky enough to come to. He didn't seem to have performed any morning toilet. He was bareheaded and barefooted. Finally, he was about ten years old. "'And who are you, my man?' said Ephraim, for he had never seen the youngster before, although he knew, or thought so, every mother's child for a dozen blocks around. The towhead looked up in the shopkeeper's face and answered that his usual appellation was Jack. "'And where do you come from?' continued Ephraim. Master Jack looked up again, but returned no reply at all. He drew in a long breath and let it out again, that sort of half-sigh that children sometimes make, still keeping his eyes at Ephraim's. "'I want some breakfast,' boldly came from his lips at last. Ephraim stopped a moment in his work of hauling out before the door his stands and milk cans, but the bit of astonishment was followed by something very much like gratified vanity." It wouldn't be every man, or woman either, that a little unfortunate might appeal to with the style of Jack's laconic speech. It was not a style where effrontery or the callous tone of an accustomed beggar struck out. It was rather like saying, "'Sir, I see that you have a good heart, and that it always delights you to do a charitable deed.' There was another thing Ephraim had ten months before— been the possessor of a little white head, not much different from Jack's, only a good deal younger. But it was its fate one melancholy evening to be the subject of the consultation of three doctors of medicine who attended it for five successive days. At the end of that time, the little white head was whiter than ever, for it was dead. So the good fellow's heart, thenceforward, warmed toward children with a still deeper warmth than before. Without any more ado or any talk about it, the milkman and the child, by silent consent, seemed to form a mental compact. The new assistant took hold, and the two helped each other in all the preparations and putting to rights. Towhead sprinkled the flagstones in front and swept them off, he would have done the same thing to the floor inside, only the owner himself had done it already. As he bustled and brushed about, Ephraim more than once stopped, under the influence of a meditative abstraction. He probably weighed in his mind the chances of the newcomer's honesty, for he looked closely at him from time to time. What particular notions flitted through the towhead, I now forget. 
and yet I ought to know something about it, for I was myself the forsaken young vagabond, who found a friend in that pearl of a milkman. The spirit of Christ impelled you, Ephraim, whether you knew it or not. If I had been turned off with the surly answer, there might have been a body lost, or perhaps a soul, for I was sorely distressed, parentless and homeless, just at the turning point where familiarity with crime is developed into something worse. Such was I when you took me in and ministered unto me. End of chapter 2 Chapters 3 and 4 of Life and Adventures of Jack Engel, an Autobiography. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life and Adventures of Jack Engel, an Autobiography by Walt Whitman. Chapter 3. Something for the Special Consideration of Those Who Pay Two Hundred a Year Pew Rent and take the sacrament from the vessels of silver and gold, Bill Jiggs, his life and death, wounds, and balm for the same. At this time I have only a confused and occasionally distinct recollection of my fortunes previous to the morning at the milkman's. You have, doubtless, supposing you to have lived in or ever visited New York, seen there many a little vagabond in dirty tatters and shirtless. They generally wander along in men's boots, picked up somewhere, whose disproportionate size makes it necessary for them to keep their feet sliding along without lifting from the ground. The shuffling movement thus acquired sometimes sticks to them through life. Nobody either cares or appears to care for these juvenile loafers. Some are the children of shame and are cast out because they would be a perpetual memento of disgrace to their generators. Some are orphans of the poorest classes. Others run away from parental brutality, which is pretty plentiful, after all, among both high and low. Others, again, take to the streets for very sustenance, those who should naturally be their protectors, living lives of drunkenness and improvidence. The revelations of the reports of the chief of police about this extensive element in what is termed the rising generation are terrible and romantic in their naked facts, far beyond any romance of the novelist. What I remember of my life previous to my introduction in the second chapter was mostly located among this class. We were indeed wanderers upon the face of the earth, although our travels did not extend beyond the limits of the city and the places within a few miles' distance. The only principle that controlled us was the instinct to live animally, to eat, if we could get it, when we were hungry, and to lie down and sleep wherever weariness overtook us. I have a very clear recollection of a most intimate crony with whom I shared luck and adventures and who did the same with me. He was a little older than myself. His name, he always said, was William, or Bill, Jiggs, but we all used to call him Bill Jiggs for convenience. Bill Jiggs was quite a magnificent fellow. When elated or very good-humored, indeed, he was wont to announce himself as one of the boys you read of in the scriptures, though which of these numerous worthies he meant he never specified. He had red hair, very red. It was never combed, but it was cut every few days by the friend who happened to be the handiest, sometimes with a scissors, sometimes with a jackknife, sharpened for the work, and once, I remember, with a broad axe. I had the honor of handling the implement myself on that occasion. Some carpenters, at work on a new house, had gone to dinner nearby and left their tools lying loose around. Poor Bill Jiggs. I came very near laying his head open. My friend would never allow me to be imposed upon by superior force or cunning, and though I was too little to add much to his weight in his own quarrels, still I sometimes managed 
to cast the balance in his favor, in cases where the odds were pretty nearly even. For Bill Jiggs was pugnacious. He entered into quarrels and fights on the smallest pretense, and sometimes received horrible drubbings. One day, I remember, he pitched into a boy considerably bigger than himself for some curt rejoinder to a critical remark of Bill Jiggs about a certain spotted cap which the aforesaid boy chose to wear on his head. He of the spotted cap got considerably the worst of the battle, which waxed hot, when he was fain to seize a good-sized paving stone that happened to be loose on the street, and dealt Bill Jiggs such a blow on the side of his head that he fell flat and senseless on the ground, and the blood poured forth freely, the victor taking to his heels like a good fellow. I mention this incident because it was the means of my first seeing an individual who years afterward, as the reader will find in the course of the story, played a prominent part in the affairs of my life. Bill Jiggs was carried in the nearest basement, and restoratives applied to him. An old Quaker lady and a little girl of my own age appeared to be the only ones at home. The old lady was very kind in her manner, and after washing Bill Jiggs' dirty and bloody head, and applying plasters from the neighboring druggists, bound it up in her own large, clean white linen handkerchief. The little girl had to fasten the knot in it, for the old lady's fingers were not nimble enough. She did so very tenderly and neatly, and she seemed to me, as I looked at her, to be a little red-cheeked angel from heaven. Bill Jiggs afterwards kept that handkerchief and couldn't be induced to part with it any way. He took it with him to Mexico several years afterward, where the poor fellow met with an uglier wound than that of the paving stone, and no old Quaker lady to look after him, a wound which sent him to a grave among the prickly cactuses. Such was the end of Bill Jiggs, than whom there are many worse young men who dress in clean shirts with straight high collars and go to church of a Sunday. This little girl, the old lady called her Martha, spoke so pleasantly to me, too, and the old lady, when we went away, told me to come there from time to time and get what she had to bestow, either of food or clothing. I don't know how it was, but neither I nor my friend ever stepped foot in that basement afterward, even when we were the hungriest. For the first time almost in our lives, we had been treated with rational benevolence as if we were real human beings. I know, in my case, it touched me with a feeling I never remembered before. Although I would have died for the old lady, or the child, I felt something like pride toward them, or perhaps for their good opinion. My impression is to this day that the little episode I have just described, that gentle old face surrounded with the plain lace edging of its cap, and the silver hair so smoothly folded, and that other face, emblem of purity and infantile goodness, and the glimpse that came upon me of a happy, peaceful, honest, well-ordered life. My belief is, I say, that all this acted with the influence of a good genius upon me afterward. Child as I was, ah, how far more deeply children think than most people imagine. I saw something of the moral of the difference between the meanness and poverty and degradation of my class and the delicacy and wholesomeness and safety of that Quaker family. I knew that I was of the same flesh and blood, and the same nature as they. I was encouraged, and, ah, how much more benefited by their really respectful kindness than they dreamed of. And here is a consideration, that the theorist on the evils of society might build a big structure upon— but as I am only jotting down a story of incidents, I will leave whoever sees these paragraphs to carry out the train of thought for himself. Chapter 4 A Hint for Unsuccessful Schoolmasters and Parents 
the first woman with whom I fell in love, my teens and how they went, I make a beginning at the big cheese, which leads to a dinner for three. Whatever seeds of evil and degradation my life in the streets had infused in my character before I took up my abode with Ephraim Foster had no chance to grow afterward. Both his wife and himself treated me like a son, and better than many people treat their sons. Kindness choked out all lingering tendencies to mischief within me, and the sentiment which just flickered a moment in my mind when we were in the basement of the Quaker lady's house here grew into form and permanence, and I loved that rough husk of a fellow with a love which was only overtopped by my affection for my dear mother, as I always call her, his wife Violet. Violet! That was the name of one for whom I bear a sentiment imperishable until my heart perishes. Let me describe her. This woman with the name of a frail and humble flower had the bodily height and breadth of a good-sized man. She was a country girl when Ephraim married her and loved to work outdoors. Her features were coarse, only her complexion was clean and healthy and her eyes beamed with perpetual cheerfulness and willingness to oblige. She had little education and what is called in the hothouse taste of the present day intellect. She had no more idea of what are now called women's rights than of the sublimest wonders of geology. But she had a beautiful soul, and her coarse big features were lighted up with more sweetness to me than any Madonna of Italian masters. With the strength of a horse, Violet possessed the gentleness of a dove. How sweetly tasted the first food she prepared for me! How fresh and fragrant the homely clothes I was given to put on that morning, after a bath in a big tub in the woodhouse, and how kindly the tone in which I was reminded of observances about the place that day! For Violet was a critical housekeeper, and dirt was an abomination in her eyes. Patient, considerate, self-denying mother. Blessed is the home, blessed are the children where such as you are found. Nearly ten years of my life were here passed, smoothly and happily. A great portion of the last six was spent at school, although I often wished to stop that and undertake some trade or employment, but my parents would not have it so. They prospered fairly, and said that they made a decent living enough now, and it would perhaps be my turn by and by when they grew old. Ephraim had his mind set on my following the profession of the law. I did not steadily oppose him in this after I found out it was a darling notion, but the truth was it by no means agreed with my own fancy. The brightest jewel, saith the Persian poet, that glitters on the neck of the young man is the spirit of adventure. I felt this spirit within me, but I repressed it and made it dumb, for I regarded their feeling who had lifted me into life worthy to be so called. You already know of my introduction to the lawyer covert. I went the next day according to appointment and made a beginning. This consisted simply in my master's giving me an outline of the course of primary reading for a law student, and in my getting familiar with the office just to take the rawness off. I was much amused with Nathaniel, the office boy, and felt a sincere pity for old Wigglesworth, and before the morning passed away we three were on very good terms together. Nat was pert enough, but he had a fund of real wit of which he was sufficiently lavish, in season and out of season. He saluted me with gravity as Don Caesar de Bazan, from a resemblance he assumed to discover between myself and the player of that part at the theatre, which Nathaniel was in the habit of honoring with an occasional shilling and his presence. And Don Caesar, he persisted in calling me from that time. Let not my lord forget that the banquet waits, said this precious youth with a droll obeisance. It was half past twelve, and I was to treat to a cheap dinner that day in commemoration of the important era of my career. 
We knew that Mr. Covert had an appointment to meet some clients at this time, and, as Wigglesworth told me very often happened, he signified his wish for a clear kitchen. The parties just anticipated our departure. Two ladies came in a carriage, which we saw at the door, a big black driver, dressed in a cape surtout, seated on the box. These ladies, this Wigglesworth also told me in the street, were the wealthy Madame Seligny and her daughter. Madame was fat enough and red enough, had a hooked nose and keen black eyes. Her person glistened and rustled with jewelry and silks, diffusing a strong scent of musk with every movement. She had a yellow silk bonnet set back on her head, and her fat hands gloved in white kid, applied a perfumed handkerchief of costly lace to the before-mentioned nose. She waddled rather than walked, and sank down panting in the great chair which Mr. Covert had placed for her. Rebecca, the daughter, offered metal more attractive. She was a pretty good specimen of Israelitish beauty, tall and slender, and in the full maturity of womanhood. She dressed with some taste, although richly, and with a little of her national fondness for jewelry. Going downstairs, I was aware that Mr. Covert from the inside shut the door and locked it. Our dinner was eaten with much approval and not a little mirth. We had some sparkling cider, which Nathaniel declared made him feel quite young again. Wigglesworth brightened up, too, and offered a toast wishing that I might have the very best luck the law could offer. That, said Nat, would be to hold on where you are and never put your foot in Covert's office again, for if you want to know this child's opinion about him, it is just— But the boy stopped himself suddenly, and in a few moments we adjourned. In the next chapter I shall fill up the blank Nat left, and also tell how I got along at the law. End of chapter 4《ジャック・エンゴル and Six of Life and Adventures of Jack Engel, an Autobiography by Walt Whitman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five. A Young Man in a Perplexing Predicament. Some Philosophy about the Same. Nathaniel and His Dog. I Behold a Young Lady Under Circumstances that Try Her Temper. Could I stand it? Would it not turn my young blood into something of a molasses article, something to be gauged and weighed, involving tear and tret, and the sage confabulations of those solid, bald-headed, respectable old gentlemen, with pencils in one hand and little blank books in the other? Could such an eternal procession of chapter ones, title twos, and section threes have any other result than to make my brain revolve like this earth on its own axis? Would it not be better to settle the difficulty with courage by calling a council of Ephraim Foster, Violet, and Covert, and frankly telling them that I found I was neither fitted for the study of the law nor the study of the law for me, and kindly but resolutely declare my determination to go no further? I had been five weeks a student in Covert's office, and the preceding reflections were the result. At my age, I have before mentioned that I was just past twenty, a young man of intelligence and health wants something to engross him, some real object for his vitality, his feelings, his almost boundless moral and physical spring. It is indefinite what it should be, some find that object in the gratification of an eager desire to go to sea, to visit different places, or other methods of mere change of locality. Some get it in the pursuit of a particular aim, on which they have set their hearts. These aims are as various as mankind, only the pursuit must not be shut out to them. With me, this craving could never be satisfied with the study of law. That was becoming more and more repugnant to me. I had not yet tasted very deeply, it is true, but it was quite enough. I felt one of those strong presentiments that I could not be happy in that way, one of those instincts which, 
without arguing much on the subject, it is generally wise to follow. But then my good father, the man who had saved me from ruin, who had overwhelmed me with obligations, who even now supplied me more liberally with pocket money than many rich men do their sons, and whose heart was firmly set on this very thing. One time lately, in a manner which would admit the inference of either joke or earnest, I had ventured a few words for an experiment to see how Ephraim would look on any such move as turning a short corner in my studentship. His countenance fell, and he winced like a fellow under a shower bath. Could I so thoroughly displease this man in almost the only serious point where he had demanded from me a compliance with his will? Allowing that it were a penance to me, ought I not to submit even for his sake, if for no other? And would not time change my aversion, and perhaps make me ashamed of my childish prejudices and weakness? Such debates and contradictions worried me exceedingly, causing my commencement in Covert's office and the following few weeks to make a real blotch in my usually happy fortunes. And after all, I came to no decision. I waded on through the slew of chapters, titles, and sections as before, and began, I fancied, to look pale and thin, as indeed became a professional personage. Not but that the dryness and cloudiness of my occupation were often relieved by gleams of warmth, interest, or fun. It was impossible not to be amused with Master Nat, and nearly all his sayings and doings, including his attachment to, and the tricks he taught, his big, docile dog, Jack, whose capers, sagacity, and even his expressive look and long yellow wool were the delight of the boy's life. Never was brute more thought of than Jack by Nathaniel, and he returned his master's friendship in kind. Jack, indeed, was very free in his demonstrations. This was exhibited one afternoon when he and Nathaniel returned from dinner. In the office by the table stood a lady, while at his desk in the next room Mr. Covert held serious talk with Pepperidge Ferris, a stock and financial speculator who frequently came there on business. The lady, who is young yet, although old enough to have cut her wisdom teeth, appeared to be waiting for Ferris. She had the stylish, self-possessed look which sometimes marks those who follow a theatrical life. Her face, though not beautiful, was open and pleasing, with bright black eyes and a brown complexion. Her figure, of good height and graceful movement, was dressed in a costly pale-colored silk. "'Ah, you have a beautiful dog,' said she, as Jack marched up to her, wagging his tail, and she leaned to pat him on the head and shoulders." Jack gave up his heart without delay, and in an instant two large and particularly muddy paws were planted on the folds of the pale silk. The lady uttered a slight scream and started indignantly back, for she was but woman, and the dress was truly splendid. But when Mr. Covert came forward in great anger and chid Nathaniel severely, and reminded him of former prohibitions about bringing Jack upon those sacred premises, and when the sagacious brute crawled in a by-place with evidently depressed spirits, and Nathaniel was more chop-fallen than would be supposed for that philosophic young gentleman, then the lady laughed a good-natured laugh. "'Oh, it's nothing,' she said. "'It is nothing. It was all my own fault, for I called him.' and she snapped her fingers and called Jack again, and expressed her confidence in the spots washing off without the least trouble, and insisted that the lawyer should find no more fault with the boy, to whom she herself spoke pleasantly. The consequence of which was, a few days afterwards, that I, at Nathaniel's suggestion, incurred an expense of some five dollars, and went to the theatre on a benefit night, after giving Wigglesworth a ticket, besides similar gifts of the same to one or two boys, Nathaniel's sworn cronies. Chapter 6 The Dancing Girl on a Benefit Night I introduce the reader to the valuable acquaintance of J. Fitzmore Smith. 
Upon the stage she looked really fascinating, and her pale silk dress, with those great folds which the dog spoiled, had given place to the short, gauzy costume of a dancing girl. Her legs and feet were beautiful, and her gestures and attitudes easy and graceful, to a degree hardly ever seen among the mechanical performers of the ballet. When this fine-looking girl, this Inez, came forward in her part, I heard especially clattering applause over in a corner of the house, where, upon examination, I discovered Master Nathaniel and his friends, each armed with big sticks, which they plied vigorously upon all the wooden work in their neighborhood. New York is a progressive city of vast resources, but in nothing is its energy more perceptible than in its juvenile population proper, their culture and their beginning early. From Nathaniel and his friends, my attention was now attracted nearer by. Um, devilish lovely girl. Um, ah? Uh? Such was the remark of a fashionably attired gentleman by my side, who nodded approvingly toward me. I had a slight acquaintance with him, and had fallen foul of him that evening just on entering the theatre, where we happened to take seats together. He was clerk in a bank not far from Covert's office, and the name on his very genteel little enameled card was J. Fitzmore Smith. Really, I beg pardon all around for not introducing, with specific description long before, this same Fitzmore Smith. Our acquaintance was, in fact, one that dated back some seasons beforehand. He was only four or five years my elder, and I first knew him as the assistant of a small dry goods store in the neighborhood of our house. Young Mr. Smith, even then, although but a boy, was very, very genteel. Conversational powers he had acquired only on a solitary theme, that of selling dry goods to the ladies, he on one side of the counter, they on the other. These powers were, however, somewhat brilliant in that way. They might be illustrated or summed up in the following phrases, varied to suit any difference of the rank, age, or temperament of purchasers. "'Shall I show you anything else today, ma'am?' "'No, ma'am, we haven't any of that article. It's not worn at all now.' "'Where will you have these things sent, ladies?' This is the real French goods, ma'am, and is very much warm. I will put it to you low. Ah, uh, that would be lower than cost price, ma'am. Indeed, I am sure you will be pleased with it. I warrant it to wash like a rock. That will be somewhat dear, ma'am. It is the very best material, and one and three pence is positively the lowest I could afford, etc., 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 take Fitzmore on any other tack, and he floundered like a whale in the shallows. He retreated to a dull muttering, interspersed with an occasional spasm of meaning. This muttering, or mumble, had the great advantage of leaving the hearer to make out of it any sort of sentiment which said hearer chose to infer. This was often very convenient. Um, ah, I believe so, and phrases of that sort made up most of my friend's stock, now that he was out of the dry goods line. In response to his praise of the dancing girl, I asked him if he had seen her before. Um, should think so. Devilish intimate with Inez. Visit her. I knew that Smith had an ambition to be on familiar terms with all sorts of notabilities, and as the dance was over we walked out and into a neighboring refreshment saloon, where he told me what he knew of Inez. She was Spanish by birth, but must have been from early life in England. At any rate, she talked the language without any foreign tone. She was very independent, had the reputation of possessing some money, well invested, and, although much talked about, Smith averred that she was as good as other people, and only to a few, of which he broadly hinted that he was one, Deign the favor of her smiles and her friendship. He announced to me quite confidentially that he often visited her, and that they were on the best terms in the world together. 
probably he read something like incredulity in my looks, for, warming over his glass of wine, he promised me, if I wished it, to give me an opportunity of paying the charming Spaniard a visit one evening in his company. End of chapter 6 Chapters 7 and 8 of Life and Adventures of Jack Engel, an Autobiography by Walt Whitman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 Portrait of a Black Sheep How the Lawyer Cheated the Carpenter My Acquaintance with Inez Ripens Marvelously The character of Covert did not take me long to understand, particularly as Wigglesworth volunteered a good deal of information about him, and what I could not help seeing from day to day in the office made up the rest. That he was an unprincipled man with boundless selfishness and avarice seemed sure enough, but whether he was a cunning villain or no puzzled me to tell. Covert, from what I had learned of Wigglesworth, had come reasonably by his swindling disposition. His father had given him lessons in it early, and he proved an apt scholar. One of his first tricks, when, as a young man, he entered upon the practice of the law, was as follows, the two arranging a plan to this effect. The father entered into a contract with an honest carpenter who had got about enough ahead for him to take such a speculation to build a house. The plan was decided on, the terms fixed, the papers drawn out, a day being mentioned in them with rigid conditions on which the house was to be completed, and the carpenter undertook his work. He had credit with the lumber, hardware, and other dealers, for he already possessed some little property of his own, and he hoped to satisfy a mortgage upon that, with the profits he should make out of Covert's job, for he did a good deal of the work himself. He had a numerous family, and he was very anxious to have for them a permanent home. Well, the job went on swimmingly, the house being enclosed, and a great portion of the inside work done. But as it went on, the coverts discovered that they wanted additional improvements made inside, various fine finishings, cornices, and etc., which could only be done slowly. The carpenter told the elder covert that, in that way, the house could not be finished at the time specified. The answer was, no one else being by, not to mind, but to go on and do the work well, without troubling about the particular day it should be completed. Our carpenter was unsuspicious, and he took the matter very easily, until the arrival of the period mentioned in the contract. The next day, as he was at work in the house with his apprentices and journeymen, he was quite thunderstruck by the coming of two constables who ordered the premises to be cleared and then closed and nailed them up. The two scoundrels had taken their precautions and prepared their way but too well. They had the law on their side, and the mechanic and his family were ruined, for a trumpery claim of damages was established, and not a single dollar did Covert pay for the work. The lumber and hardware merchants levied for their bills on the carpenter's own little property, all of which it took to pay them, and every dollar of his toil-earned savings was at once swept away. Such formed one of Lawyer Covert's beginnings in life, under the tutoring of his precious parent, who was withal a sanctified man, wore a white neckcloth, and wouldn't have taken the name of the Lord in vain on any account. Whether the old fellow is alive yet, I don't know, but the son is, damn him. Covert, of course I'm talking about the lawyer now, had, among the forms of his selfishness, some political ambition. He had been up once already for the state legislature, but was defeated. At the present time he took some pains to get a nomination for the assembly, our city members being then elected by general ticket, and he expected to be carried on the tide with the rest, for his party had shown a handsome working majority, as it is called, at the preceding contest. Wigglesworth could not say much about Covert's pecuniary condition. He told me that the lawyer lived in good style, however, in an uptown street, that, although occasionally pinched for money, 
he managed to make both ends meet, and that his business was tolerably extensive. In the treatment of me, the lawyer was civil, without paying any particular attention. He evidently didn't consider me worth taking much pains about, either to gain my friendship or prevent my enmity, and doubtless troubled his mind little concerning me. It looked businesslike to have a student in the office, and I was occasionally of some assistance in copying or hunting up authorities. All this while my dislike to the profession remained the same, and the conflict was from time to time resumed, in my mind, whether to give it up or not. Covert himself was such an unfavorable illustration of the class that it by no means helped to reconcile me to the prospect of joining them. Inez visited our office two or three times after the adventure with Jack, and somehow we struck up quite an acquaintance together. I must confess I was a little bashful at first, but her manner was easy and sociable without being at all forward, and a young man does not long remain bashful when treated kindly by a pretty woman. One day Inez had to wait half an hour for Mr. Covert's return. Old Wigglesworth sat in his corner, deeply immersed in some specially intricate copying. Nathaniel was out in the long, wide passageway, having a romp with his dog, and, as no one else seemed on hand to do the honors, I placed a chair for Inez, sat down nearby on another, and soon made quite astonishing progress for a youth who knew so little of the sex. We talked, laughed, spoke of Inez's benefit, and so forth, and had a very agreeable hour, toward the close of which the Spaniard gave me her address and invited me to call and see her, as she was not performing that evening. I mentioned Mr. J. Fitzmore Smith's name, and said that he spoke of her as an old acquaintance. She laughed and said, "'Bring him along with you, for I don't know that I dare have you come and see me alone.' Now it struck me that I had a great deal rather not have him, and I told Inez so, but she laughed more heartily than before. "'I make Smith an indispensable condition,' said she, "'for I see that my fears were well founded.' Covert now came in, and our sociability, much to my regret, was done with. From the conversation that ensued, for I was curious to know what brought her here, I found that these visits of the dancing girl had reference to some investment of her spare funds in stock. Covert, among his other employments, had got himself chosen officer in an insurance company, and Pepperidge Ferris and Smith were instrumental in advising Inez to make the investment. Perhaps I had no ground for suspicion, yet I determined to find out something of the particulars of the affair, for I didn't consider either Smith or Ferris immaculate. CHAPTER Eight, THE CHARACTER AND HOME OF THE DANCING GIRL A DELIGHTFUL EVENING FOR THREE I ALMOST FALL IN LOVE, IF JEALOUSY IS ANY SIGN Inez, she never went by any other name except in legal documents, when the term a Spanish dancing girl was added, Inez belonged to that class of professional people, including a majority of those whose parents earned their living, by serving the public and depending on the latter's favor, who are prematurely developed. These unfortunates have the experience of men and women while yet in early youth. Under feverish stimulants, they come forward like hot-house plants, and sometimes their growth is unwholesome and as fragile. With Inez, however, there was the saving fact of a strong vein of native common sense. She afterward told me, when we became more intimate, that the first man she really loved, and she loved in the morning of her life, taught her the most profitable lesson she had ever learned. He was treacherous. She was devoted and confiding, and that treachery it was that, with the scorching mark of a hot iron burnt on her heart, the precept caution, the great need that is so long coming to young souls, and that, when it comes, puts an end forever to the freshest joys and the thoughtless abandon of their lives. And yet it is so useful in this wicked world, and we cannot get along without it. And so, as the dose must be taken, 
The sooner the wry face is passed and the qualms gone, the better. Oh, I have not traveled alone through so many lands. I have not gained my bread among shows and coarse people, making journeys and taking up with any kind of accommodation, subject to all sorts of proposals and all variations of applause, indifference and scorn. I have not gone through these and much more for nothing. You have candidly asked me my own opinion of myself. I will be as candid with you. I know that I am not good. But I feel also that I never have been and am not abandoned enough to be unworthy the sympathy of those who are good. I am conscious of having committed no spiteful meanness. I wound or receive no one who trusts in me. I have never wronged a human being. I have not thought myself better than the degraded and lost ones, but rather pity and relieve them. She stopped abruptly and looked at us with her sharp black eyes. But am I not making myself ridiculous, she added. On the contrary, I felt a real admiration for this independent and, in some respects, unfortunate girl, and the evident truth which impelled her to talk of her character in that way impressed my feelings strongly. But, whether jealousy or not, something put the thought in my head at this moment, could this woman love such a fop as Smith? She might have got along with Smith, because that is a manly acceptance of one's destiny, and a plump defiance of the world. But Smith was a sort of sneaking and cowardly evasion, a consciousness of something wrong, and a timid desire to dust people's eyes about it. I answered nothing to the question of Inez, and Smith gave his eternal, Oh, um, oh, no indeed. We had coffee and some biscuits. It was delightful coffee, made by Inez herself, in, as she told us, the Spanish fashion. A stout, rosy Irish woman, of all the people in the world, Mrs. Nancy Fox, wife of Barney Fox and mother of seven little foxes, served us these refreshments. Or rather, she appeared to serve us, but Inez was in such good spirits and so nimble and graceful that she really did everything. Barney and Nancy and the little children lived in a rear building on the same premises, and the services of the tidy, industrious Irishwoman were quite invaluable to Inez, who had formed an attachment to her, and requited her liberally. Barney followed the honorable business of hod-carrying, and, at a pinch, even took a place under government as a street sweeper. Barney was up to snuff, too, as will be shown by and by. And now, when I look back upon it, there have been stupider evenings past than the one which was talked and sipped away by us in that comfortable little parlor. There we were in easy chairs, encompassing a round table in the middle of the room, a fine astral lamp shedding a soft light over everything, the cheerful fire, for it was a chilly evening, in the open grate, by the side whereof, on a substantial ottoman, when everybody had been helped to coffee, was placed Mrs. Fox herself, in her snowy cap and clean check apron, placed there compulsorily, and as well supplied as the rest, by Inez herself, with one of the junior foxes, pretty little Maggie, crouching close into the folds of her gown, and quite too much awestruck with the grandeur of the scene to enjoy the cakes which Inez fed her with from time to time. By Jupiter, yes, I remember it so well now. Inez brought out an old guitar, the tuning whereof was a work of more labor than love. She sang to us some pleasing songs, first in English, and then as the evening wore on, and she sang better, in Spanish. And when Mrs. Fox, burdened with the fragments of the feast, quite a stock of delicacies for her, took her departure, we sat and listened and listened. Inez had not a voice of much power, but there was a deep feeling in her songs, and in her way of performing them. They were plaintive, without being melancholy. The night was by no means extremely late when we left. Somewhat to my surprise, and far more to my gratification, my quondam friend Smith departed with me. Why, said I, as he took his hat, and went forth into the passageway at the same time, why, I supposed you were here to stay. 
That is, I didn't know you were going with me now. I no sooner uttered the words than I felt that I had made an unfortunate slip. Smith colored and twirled his little whisker. Um, not at present, I think. Inez darted her keen eyesight from his face to mine. Doubtless, with a woman's intuition, she divined the real truth. There was a pause for a moment, and I felt a little apprehensive that the hot-blooded Spaniard was going to give us a taste of her temper. But she didn't. She laughed gaily, and then with more deliberation than usual she said, looking me in the face, "'Of all supposings in the world, you could not have supposed anything more absurd. You will learn that to a certainty one of these days.' for I hope you will come and see me again when I send for you, for we have had a pleasant evening, and I like you. Good night. Good night, Smith. And she quickly turned, went in, and locked the door, without waiting for another word. Um, said the bank clerk, as we walked homeward. Devilish girl for joking. How well she carried off that last one. I had never before heard anything from Smith involving such a deep process of thought as this way of getting over that dash of cold water. End of chapter 8 Chapters 9 and 10 of Life and Adventures of Jack Engel, an autobiography by Walt Whitman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 Visit Covert's house, meet there with a person I know and don't know, two political parties illustrated, curiosity of Barney Fox. Covert succeeded in getting the nomination, and afterwards there were two or three informal gatherings at his house to take measures for securing his election. By his request, I was present at one of these, for since his nomination, he had, of course, grown very polite, to me among the rest. He wanted Ephraim Foster's vote and influence, which was not small, and for those meetings it was his object to have them pretty full. When I knocked at Covert's door, it was just after dark. I found I had anticipated the time, and the lawyer was not yet home. In answer to my pull at the bell, a young woman opened the door and the light of a street lamp falling on her face reminded me, as people are often vaguely and provokingly reminded, of features they have seen before, but where or how they cannot tell. The young woman was neatly dressed in Quaker style, though with warmer colors, and a little more of the ornamental than is common in that rigid sect. What the lamplight allowed me to see of her face impressed me very agreeably, she asked me in, said that Mr. Covert would doubtless be home in a little while, and if I wished to wait, I could walk in the room. I would wait, but I sat down by a table in the wide hall, on which there were books and newspapers. The young woman stopped a moment to raise the light that hung suspended from the ceiling, and as she did so, and her face was turned upward, the puzzle of having seen her somewhere again bothered me. Where could it have been? I was almost tempted to say as much to her, but she had arranged the lamp and walked quietly down the basement stairs. Probably Covert's daughter, thought I, and, if so, I could not congratulate her on her parentage. But no, she hadn't any of his features. Her eyes were gray, with a tender, affectionate expression, her face blooming and healthy, her figure plump almost to the point of being fat, and her figure, hands, neck, and so on, all finely formed. Besides, she was very nimble in her movements with all her plumpness, as I saw by her management of the lamp and her walk past me to the head of the stairs. I even listened to satisfy myself of the lightness and rapidity of her step. You see, I had arrived, of late, at quite a degree of interest in all these important matters. Particularly since my acquaintance with Inez, I found myself worked up to an astonishing amount of curiosity that way. When Covert came, he brought a couple of friends with him, and we adjourned to the parlor. 
More people dropped in, and the room was quite full. The two friends were Alderman Bry, an opulent wholesale grocer, and the Honorable Isaac Leach, a gentleman of fortune. Although these were alike supporters of Mr. Covert, they were as far as the poles asunder in their political principles. Principles. Yes, that is what they called them. Why, sir, I heard Alderman Rye's voice above the rest, is not this evidence enough of the poisonous consequences of Whig misrule? Isn't the country already almost ruined? Ruined, sir? Fortunately, I was seated in the back room, but I heard those shrill voices in front there quite plainly enough. That we are down, sir, that we are down as a commercial people, I grant you, was the response of the Honorable Isaac Leach, but not from anything done by the Whig Party. Sir, that party is the palladium of our freedom. Sir, the local focos would utterly destroy this nation in five years if they had their own way. Their leaders are blind to truth, and the whole party is regardless of law. Law? The Whigs ride over the Constitution without mercy. Bargains? Corruption is their game. Did not General Jackson remove those deposits without the shadow of legal authority? But who spent money like water in bribing members of Congress? The veto power, sir, is dangerous to our liberties. Then a medley of bargain and corruption. Clay. Adams. I deny it, sir. I can prove it. And so forth and so on. A pretty fair sample, this, of what happened whenever the Honorable Isaac Leach came in contact with Alderman Rye. They seemed not only to enjoy it, but to think they were holding a very profound discussion of much interest to their hearers. Covert had some difficulty in choking off these angry disputes and in broaching the object of the meeting. That was, to make some movement which would carry abroad the appearance of his being popular with both parties. There was a probability of some discontent among the regulars, and he had a hope of getting a good many votes on the opposition side. I did not stay to take part in it, but departed, after asking Covert if there was anything he wanted me to do for him. He pulled out of his pocket a greasy letter, much creased in what appeared to have been unsatisfactory efforts to fold it, and said that he had a good deal to attend to, and it would oblige him if I would answer that. He cared not particularly any what way, except that he wished not to offend the writer of the epistle and his friends. For, said he, all their votes count, either against me or for me. The next morning I had the pleasure of entering into a correspondence with the gentleman whose name was signed to the fellow's epistle. My first impulse was to decline the job in disgust, but upon second thought I went into the thing as a good joke. Sir, axing your pardon, I make bold to write a few lines, being appointed by a committee of fellow citizens, for the purpose of informing myself on a few subjects concerning the next election, of which you are a candidate, that is to say as follows. What is your opinion of street-sweeping machines? Are you in favor of raising sweepers' wages to ten shillings a day? Will you pledge yourself to vote for a law furnishing sweepers with new broom gratis for nothing? Are you in favor of rainy days being paid for, and men not made to work out in the nasty mud to the danger of their health? Sir, many of your fellow citizens is deeply interested in your opinions on these vitally important subjects. Please inform us of your views on these subjects at an early day. With great respect, on behalf of the committee, Barney Fox. Chapter 10 What different luck the election brought to the lawyer and the street sweeper. 
I make another visit to Inez. Some months now passed away, carrying with them the fall and winter, during which no incidents occurred that are necessary to be narrated in any detailed manner in this veracious history of my life and adventures. Whether from the unsatisfactory nature of my answer to Barney Fox's questions, or some other cause, Covert lost his election. There had come a revulsion in what the newspapers call public sentiment, and the party which carried the day a season or two before was now completely swamped. The Honorable Isaac Leach came forth in colors of resplendent glory, and Alderman Rye labored under deep depression of spirits. As to Mr. Fox, he showed more sense than I had given him credit for. He discovered suddenly that he had always been an ardent advocate and laborer for the party now successful, and, on the strength of the importance given him by his appointment as a committee of one in an exciting election contest, and as the representative of a large body of fellow citizens, all of whom have votes, and, like wide-awake members of a Republican government ought to do, lose no occasion of using them. Mr. Barney Fox, the cunning dog, before anybody knew it, had the coolness to propose for and secure a really nice little contract for digging out and filling up certain public grounds in his ward. Now Barney possessed not ten dollars in the world, and his getting the contract was partly the result of his natural impudence and partly luck. But Barney found friends after his good fortune once came upon him, and from that day was totally oblivious toward street sweeping, nor took any more interest in machines that might interfere with the manual performance of that avocation. In a few months from the time of his promotion, he bought a big lot of ground at Hoboken, and had a neat, comfortable two-story cottage on the same, and moved over Mrs. Fox and the Little Foxes, now increased in number to eight, and let out two rooms in the upper story to whoever wanted fine, airy lodgings for the summer. "'And a happy woman I'd be this day,' said Barney's wife, as she took her departure from the rear building. "'If it wasn't for the leaving of you, Miss Inez, if you were me own daughter, I could not feel sorrier.' "'Nancy, dear, you are a good creature, and don't talk about it, for isn't the fairy handy, and shan't I take your two rooms for my own sweet self this summer and live with you again?' This assurance of Inez comforted the good, faithful Irishwoman more than anything else. She went off, followed by her juvenile procession, all as clean and neat as plenty of soap and pure water could make both their clothes and their bodies. Nancy was the tidiest dame in the land, and a good-looking one withal, and Inez, as I have before intimated, had a thoroughly filial affection for her. She had bestowed a hearty kiss and a present besides on every little fox before the procession took its departure. Inez gave me this description the same evening when I visited her, really for my own good pleasure, but nominally to beg permission to bring a friend who had seen her on the stage and was eager for a closer acquaintance. It was a ridiculous whim, so I thought it anyhow, for Inez to insist so generally on my paying visits only when accompanied by a companion. Our acquaintance had now continued several months, and this was about the first time whenever I came without Smith or when Nancy was always minding her brood of children, that she did not, under some trivial pretense or other, either shorten her own stay in the room, or frankly say, Now, there's a good boy. Don't stay any longer, for I want to be alone. Don't take any offense. Only I want you to go. It was cool, but her manner was so good-natured, and there was no help for it. This evening I was more fortunate. The Spaniard was in her most pleasant humor, and I fell into giving her a description of my early vagabond life, which proved to be, as we soon discovered on comparing notes, 
not unlike her own in some respects. "'And have you really the singular fortune,' asked the dancing girl, "'not to know who your parents were?' "'I have that singular fortune, good or bad, whichever it may be,' returned I. Inez favored me with a glance of sympathy. "'Unless old Wigglesworth is going to tell me all about it,' I added, laughing, "'for he gave out some strange hints the other day, "'and seemed to be on the point of imparting to me a terrible secret. "'Poor old fellow. "'You know him, do you not? "'The little toothless old man always writing in the corner of your office? "'That's Mr. Wigglesworth, "'a gentleman for many years fond of brandy or gin, "'as came most convenient.' Of late, under the ministerings of Mr. Calvin Peterson, father of the young man who, as I was telling you, wishes the pleasure of your valuable acquaintance, under his ministerings, poor Wigglesworth has become a Methodist of the most devoted sort, a real prostrate and convicted sinner who thinks only of the world to come. Poor old man, said Inez, don't make fun of him. No doubt he is better than either of us. No doubt, I think so too, my beautiful Inez. But we are not old nor toothless, and I think there is a great deal of heavenly enjoyment in the world that quite attracts my attention from anything in the world to come. I took the liberty of looking at Inez in a manner which brought me the reward of a boxed ear, and the dancing girl, blushing but laughing, went and sat on the other side of the table. This evening I certainly felt my first installment of the cunning of the devil, which might be expected to come in due time to one who persisted in studying the profession of the law. I turned the conversation to my early life again, for that was a sort of connecting link between Inez and myself, in sympathy as well as fact. I saw that she was interested, and that, as I went on jabbering on with my narration, the glow of interest in pity colored her face. I thought before that she looked well, but now she seemed bewitching. The blood rushed like racehorses through my young veins. The hours wore on, for, somehow, our tongues were loosed, and we both had more to tell, interesting egotists that we were, then seemed possible to be condensed into one night. Inez spoke of her own childhood, but she had parents, and that was a great advantage. The advantage, though, did not continue long, for her parents died while she was yet very young, and afterward it was that came her toughest time of existence. It was indeed full of pitfalls and just escaped quicksands. She narrated her life with great candor, and an impassioned fluency gave her a peculiar charm. I know not how it was, but before we were aware of it, we were seated close to one another again, and my hand fell upon her white shoulder, sending an electric shock through my whole frame. Inez was more charitable now, and my ears escaped this time. Yes, our early lives had not been unlike— my voice sank to a low tone, for Inez was quite near enough to hear me, and I spoke of those days and scenes of wandering and hunger and misery. My poor friend Bill Jiggs was not forgotten, and it pleased the generous-hearted Spaniard right well to hear of his rude courage and self-denial and the protection he wielded in my behalf. I spoke of Ephraim Foster, too, and the good Violet. They, above all, were after Inez's own heart, and there was a pressure on my arm responsively to the eloquent description, as I'm sure it was, which I gave of their kindness to me, and to the blessings I called down upon them. I grew more and more pliant of tongue, and recalled for the dancing girl, who had not for some time spoken a word, the impression she first made upon me, when I saw her at Covert's office at the time the dog planted his muddy paws on her dress. I expatiated on our pleasant acquaintanceship since, and, as in a voice lower still, I spoke of the hearts beating against each other, 
of two young living and loving beings, I pressed a burning kiss upon her lips. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven and Twelve of Life and Adventures of Jack Engel, an Autobiography by Walt Whitman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven Questions which seemed no chance of being answered, my name accounted for, Calvin Peterson and his boarder, Curiosity of Covert. Wigglesworth was certainly a little demented. "'How do you know your name ought to be Jack Engel? "'It's right, of course, oh, of course. "'But why don't you inquire? "'Inquire of whom? "'Who knows? "'Perhaps I know. "'Perhaps Covert knows. "'Perhaps Ephraim Foster knows.' "'These were some of the sagacious remarks of Wigglesworth, "'jerked out now and then, "'when no one was in the office but we two. "'Since his conversion to Methodism,' The old man had altogether given up drinking, and the result was that without the stimulant which had his been accustomed support for fifty years, he felt low-spirited enough at times. He looked worse than ever, and after taking the advice of Ephraim, I counseled the old man to indulge himself moderately in drinking, for now it was too late. Wigglesworth stood with one foot in the grave and to deprive him totally of drink, we thought likely, under the circumstances, to do him more harm than good. If he had reformed in that respect years before, however, he would no doubt have now been a healthier and happier man. With respect to my name being what appears at the head of this autobiography, all that I knew about it was this, for Ephraim and Violet had informed me of as much, and it tallied with my own recollection. Jack Engel was the name whereby I called myself, and remembered being called among the very few who use more than my first appellative. It was the name which I gave at our first acquaintance to Violet's serious questionings. Moreover, the morning I came, in my rags, to the benevolent milkman's door, I was wearing in my ear a ring, some three-quarters of an inch in diameter, which I never remembered being put there, but which I knew had hung there as long as my childish memory could know anything about it. It was a plain, round ring, with a thick square bar straight across the lower quarter, and somehow had stuck to me through all my wanderings. Probably this good luck was attributable to the fact that the ring, in its dimness and dirt, passed for nothing more valuable than brass. Upon an examination which Violet made, soon after their adoption of me, this ring proved to be of gold. The little crossbar was double, and when the two parts were separated, there was plainly to be seen, on the one which was concealed before, the words Jack Engel, a discovery which so confirmed my juvenile traditions that Ephraim and his wife concluded to give up their first intention of bestowing upon me their own name. Besides, they had some honest religious scruples about their right to make any change. Who knew but what I had been christened with that name? A year afterward an incident occurred which, although perhaps of no importance, may as well be mentioned here, for it was one of the very few links which had any connection with the mystery of who the deuce I was, and whence I came. Our pious acquaintance, once casually alluded to in the last chapter, Mr. Calvin Peterson, eked out a frequently scanty living by taking boarders. Calvin wouldn't have any but pious ones, and his accommodations were not very select. One of his inmates, perhaps two years subsequent to the period described in the second chapter, where I do myself the honor of making the reader's acquaintance, was a middle-aged man who stayed with the Petersons only a couple of weeks, waiting the departure of a brig in which he was going to take passage for a port in South America. The man said very little about himself, except that he was bound abroad with the intention of bettering his fortunes, and had no particular idea of soon returning. Once, when I was there playing with Tom Peterson, a boy of my own age, this man, hearing him call my name in full, 
came down on the back stoop, and I remember his standing so long and looking so gravely at me that I noticed it and felt a childish feeling of annoyance. The next morning he came around to Ephraim's, asked for me, drew me to his side, and looking at me again as before, inquired of Ephraim how I came to be there. Ephraim told him the history of the morning two years previous, and added what he had learned from me of my former life. The man said he knew more concerning me than would do any good to tell, and that the name I went by was the right one. There were two big tears under his eyes as he kissed me on the cheek. He thanked God over and over again that I had fallen in such good protection. He lifted his hands over me and fervently invoked a blessing on me. He was a devout man, as Mrs. Peterson informed Violet afterward, and, telling Ephraim that he might hear from him again at a future time, if he ever returned from abroad, our strange visitor departed. But the trouble of names, or an inquiry into my parentage, formed about the slightest of mine or Ephraim's cares. The vagabond child had not been left for twenty years uncared for, except by strangers, and unasked for, to make it likely that there would suddenly arise some mighty important story to throw a romance about him and his affairs. I was not such a fool as to suppose so. When I thought about it at all, which was very seldom, my mind had no other point to arrive at than the plain and evident supposition that my pedigree, if traced at all, as it appeared likely would never be the case, would be found in the lowest grade of society, and that my parents were doubtless dead long before this time. Faith. It seemed just now as if there were a combination to agitate this subject, and hardly anything else. For, in addition to poor crazy old Wiggleworth's mutterings, lawyer Covert sent for Ephraim, and, under the pretense of being interested in me, made minute inquiries concerning all the facts with which the reader is already acquainted. He even made Ephraim sit down, and repeat them to him deliberately. The morning when I came for my breakfast, the history of the cross-barred ring, and the incident of the stranger and his visit. Probably it was that Mr. Covert, in the activity of his heart, amused himself with making a fanciful story for me when he had nothing else to do. Often afterward, when I looked up from the desk, wearied and inwardly cursing the whole science of law, with all its appurtenances, and hereditaments, I would behold Mr. Covert gazing fixedly at me in what appeared to me a curious manner. At the time I paid no attention to these things, nor to several other incidents that happened, and peculiarities in his treatment toward me. It was only after other developments were made that I recalled them. Of these we shall have a true account in the course of the story. CHAPTER Twelve. THE FATHER, A CHARACTER DRAWN FROM LIFE, A REVIVAL MEETING, AN ENGAGEMENT WITH WIGGLESWORTH. The world has been favored with many portraits of religious fanatics, Methodists, Presbyterians, Roman Catholics, etc. They are depicted in plays, in novels, and in poems. But they are generally wrong in one point. They do not make the enthusiast sincere while in reality the religious enthusiast is always sincere. Moreover, he or she is like all human specimens, a compound of both good and evil. As far as the enthusiasm of religion goes, it is not necessarily bad, but rather the reverse. Only it cannot altogether change other main portions of the character of the individual. They remain and give their stamp as before. Calvin Peterson was not an exception to the above general rule. Nature made him with strong mental features. He had great resolution and fortitude. He could have borne, with savage endurance, any pains or penalties that came in consequence of his religious faith. It was, indeed, rather a welcome thing to him to endure the little privations that resulted from that faith 
and little annoyances are harder than great ones. But Calvin had none of the softer sentiments, or if he had, they were, in him, made hard and heavy in appearance. His affection for his family regarded their immortal welfare more than their temporal good, and the latter sometimes felt the effects of this partiality. But it would be unjust to this man to deny that his strongest desire tended to be what he considered the greatest and most enduring benefit of those whom he cared for. It was simply his view of the case. In respect to the simple virtues of honesty and integrity, Calvin was like a guileless child. His son, Tom, my friend, loved his father at heart, but it was a love which had not been cultivated and strengthened by mutual intimacy and good offices. It is often so with father and son. Tom thought his father too rigid, and the parent thought the young man too loose and irregular. Sometimes they had very serious disputes, and Tom, once in a while, almost thought he felt a repugnance to his own father. While I was quite a boy, and Tom too, we would often go to the Methodist meetings. Calvin Peterson was one of the shining lights here, and I have seen some pretty impressive spectacles under his exhortations. That there was a good deal of real devotional feeling, there could be no doubt. A New York revival meeting. How strongly the impression remains upon me of one of these. It was an agreeable autumn night, neither hot nor chilly. The windows of the church were partially open, for it was crowded inside. Crowded? Why, every seat and standing place, step and corner were filled, crammed close and full. You enter at the door, scanned sharply by a man who held the knob inside. You had felt his pressure as you opened the door, for he admitted no one quickly and gave you a solemn and satisfied stare from head to foot. Perhaps he would, by signs, direct you to some part nearer the altar, where you could find a seat by crowding closely. "'Come down, O Lord! O oh, come down this night! Come down! Come right down here, O Lord!' With hands thrown in the air, and head turned upward, I saw Calvin Peterson, his face all wet with perspiration, and it was his voice I heard. Now, brethren, let us pray. And Calvin's, too, was the voice of prayer. It was a violent, declamatory, passionate appeal to the Creator, who was spoken to in an earnest but familiar style, and invoked many times to come there, and be present in the midst of his worshippers. Nor was Calvin's prayer without feeling. He supplicated for all, for his own children. Tom was with me, but had not the grace to feel the least affected. For all the wicked, the poor, and the ignorant. Most of all, however, he wished an indescribable something, which appeared to be the most important requisite in making men what they should be. Touch our hearts with fire, O Lord! Break the rebellious rock! Make us see how wicked and utterly vile and helpless we are without thee. Oh, send down thy spirit to be here, and dwell in the midst of us. Thy spirit is what we most need, and having that, we have all, etc., etc. Toward the last of his prayer, Calvin struggled violently, for he had got the steam up, and was under full headway. The other men inside of the altar and around it, they too swayed their bodies like trees in the wind, and many an amen and emphatic groan were interspersed from these during Calvin's prayer. And even if it all were without the formality and literary refinement of some other devotional outpourings, as it came thus fresh and genuine from the heart, why can we not suppose that it was as effective in the estimation of the deity as even the most polished and elegant supplications? The altar was fronted by a railing in the shape of a crescent, and this railing had at its foot 
a wide cushioned step stretching the whole distance. Kneeling on this step, as close together as they could be, were many young girls and women, their faces bent in their hands, and some of them sobbing violently. Occasionally one of the men inside the railing would bend down and whisper to the girls, who, however, appeared to make no answer. "'Pray for them, brothers! Oh, pray for them!' said Calvin, pointing to these girls, and to a number of men and boys also, who were kneeling and crouching, some of them flat on the floor, all around the space near the altar. And Calvin would occasionally come out and walk around among them, and here and there stoop down and speak to them. It was a good deal a matter of impulse with Mr. Peterson. Once, for example, at the close of a hymn, he spoke out in a loud voice, "'Let all those who love the Lord rise from their seats!' There was a pause, and, sad to relate, only one individual, a pale, shame-faced young man, a tailor's apprentice, responded to the appeal. Then they sang. This was the best part of it. For they sang with a will, and loved best the wild, almost grotesque tunes that there are so many of in America. What a strange charm there is in the human voice, so far ahead of instruments, to produce certain effects. I could have listened to their singing all night. There was one song in particular intended to describe a contest between the soul's inclination to religion on the one side and worldly pleasure on the other. O oh, come, my soul, and let us take an evening walk becoming thee. But whither dost thou choose we take our course? O oh, to Calvary or Gethsemane. But Calvary is a mountain high. Tis too difficult a task for me. And I have heard there are lions in the way. And they lurk on the path to Gethsemane. Such were the two opening verses of this popular old camp meeting song, which then went on to describe, in a manner worthy of John Bunyan, the struggle in the heart between the loves and lusts of the flesh as opposed to the dictates of duty. These strong, even vulgar allegories always seize hold of the general feelings, and as for me, I love them yet. In the singing, all joined who were so disposed, and thought to what is a cultivated ear, there would probably be discord enough, the congregation present at meetings of this sort have nothing of that to annoy them. Nor am I sure but what a truly cultivated musical taste would have experienced an unwanted charm in those fresh, quaint tunes and hymns. At an advanced hour of the night, when all parties were pretty well exhausted, such a revival meeting as I have above described broke up, and the congregation poured forth on their way homeward. The revival meeting, I have described, was as I remember them when Tom Peterson and myself, boys of fifteen and sixteen years, used to go of a Sunday evening, and sometimes during the week, to these assemblages. They are pretty much the same to this day. Since we were grown up, however, both Tom and I were more delicate about going, for Tom had a very natural idea that his father did not make any great accessions to his dignity by his conduct at these revivals. It was on his return from such a meeting, I having been out pretty late myself in a different scene, that I met Wigglesworth. The old man was in a high state of excitement. I attributed it to the religious fever which had now altogether penetrated him. Jack, said he, taking my hand and speaking in a very earnest, hurried manner, I want to have a serious talk with you. My dear old fellow, I answered, it will all prove useless. I fear I shall prove a sinner for some years yet. 
"'No, no,' he cried in a still more impassioned manner. "'It is nothing of that sort. "'It is about sin, to be sure, for it is about covert. "'Oh, Jack, I shall unravel the most rascally tricks of that man to you. "'The most—' "'But, Wigglesworth, I am not covert's keeper. "'These things do not concern me.' "'Ah, there you are wrong again,' cried the old man. They do deeply concern you. They concern an innocent and much wronged orphan whom that scoundrel has in his house, in a position little better than a servant. They concern your birth and fortunes. Oh, they concern many things. Old man, I said, a little excited now myself, you are certainly out of your wits. "'I do not blame you for thinking so,' he answered, "'for I confess it is wondrous strange, but only hear me. "'Promise to come to my boarding-house and have a talk with me, let me see, "'the night after to-morrow, and you will change your mind.' "'To pacify him and start him homeward, "'as much as with any hope of learning what would interest me, "'I gave the required promise.' Wigglesworth made me repeat it, and then went his way without another word. End of chapter 12